Welcome to ContraSense, a podcast exploring current issues and new research from the social sciences. I'm Vlad Bejinariu, and together with my colleague Maria Martelli, we'll be discussing big data today. It's no news that so much of what we do is being recorded, whether we give it out ourselves, such as what we do on Facebook, or we don't even realize, such as when we leave Google Maps running in the background of our phones, or when you just cross the sidewalks that are video surveilled. We know the data exists, but why does it exist? Why is there so much of it, and how is it produced? Our guest today is Irina Kulik, whose topics of research have been nationalism, inter-ethnic relations, minority politics in Romania and Hungary, political and cultural elites. She teaches sociology at the Department of Sociology at the University of Babes Boje. Her present work in Romania, migration to Canada and the US is a strategic research site for understanding the functioning of states through migration policies. As she will be teaching a course in the political economy of big data next year, and since we're quite interested in that, we figured it would be a good idea to grasp how we can think through this topic. So we're uh, very glad to have you with us today, Irina. Thank you for having me. I'm very glad to be here. I've been following the podcast that you've done, and I'm really excited to be your guest today. So Irina, if you can tell us what is what means big data and uh, how did it all start? Okay, so... There's a very simple, straightforward definition that some people in the computer science and business define as big data. And this is everything that is bigger enough not to fit in a spreadsheet. But of course, this uh, kind of definition does not really have uh, any specifics. So a more analytic definition, which has been accepted, in studies that have to do with big data relates to a number of characteristics of it. First of all, that is huge in volume. So the volume, that means that what we call big data is usually a kind of data that consists of terabytes or petabytes of data, something that would mean, for example, I don't know, three million pages of someone's activity on Google this constitutes big data, then it's high in velocity, it's very diverse in variety, it's also structured and unstructured, it's almost everything that you can capture and get and uh, also produce, and it's considered to be exhaustive in scope, that is, striving to capture entire population or system where you, the end of the population is all, everything. So basically, everything that exists, but also very fine-grained, so the granularity of big data is much, uh, much, much improved than the kind of data that we were used to, like census data or survey data, and it's also uniquely indexical in identification. It's also relational in nature, that is, it contains common fields that enable the conjoining of different data sets, which is all uh, something extraordinary, and also is very flexible. That means that it can be extended, you can add new fields, new data very easily, and it's scalable. That means that it can expand in size rapidly, and it actually is It's continuously expanding. It's like, as I said, intermittent, incontinent production of of data. There are uh, other ways that we can imagine the data. And I have to say that my own understanding and the kind of definition that I use for big data is related to what we call the Internet of Things. And to me, big data is the totality of traces that people or somebody that acts or has the property of an actor like an organization. So the traces that these people leave during the everyday going on their lives. So both of them are fundamental. First of all, the Internet of Thing as a conversational space where a multitude of objects are interconnected and we use these objects all the time and uh, they also determine us to act. But for which we seem to be almost like appendices or there's this metaphor of humans as sensors for apparatus. And by Internet of Things, we understand the whole network of 
physical objects that are interconnected, for example, smart devices like smartphones, Fitbits, chip cards that we use in uh, bank technology, smartwatches, but also smart cars, smart buildings, the apparatus that we use in our kitchens, uh, all those domestic systems of surveillance and automatizations, medical systems of monitoring and caring and so on and so forth, the laptops, tablet, everything. And they all have sensors, they are all connected to internet and they have the capacity to collect and to change and to process data that then can be accumulated and stored electronically. And second, it's this continuous uh, uh, incontinent production of data that results simply from the fact that we do something and we move around these, these objects. So to me, Big data is something that is produced by people as some sort of appendices to a huge network of objects that are interconnected and then we call Internet of Things. Okay, so I think I see that uh, maybe we should um, explain a bit better. I think there are like two main things happening around here. First, maybe we need to understand... Um, How did this happen? How uh, the, the fact that the collection of big data is directly related to a technical change, obviously, it wouldn't have been possible before the internet or before computers. Definitely not. But also the fact that it's possible now, it's not just the internet or computer making it happen, but the way everything is set, like set up, the, way, the fact that we have Google, Google or the fact that we have governments that allow the collection of big data. So this is one thing. And the second thing is, I, th I think it's very interesting how you said that we are um, becoming um, like uh, sensors for objects. So the, the second thing and the worry, which I think in, the, in this topic of big data, there, there, there are many emotions going along, like maybe excitement and enthusiasm. And another one of the most mad emotions or the emotion that I meet big data with is sometimes worry, because I do not understand its implications exactly. And uh, the fact that it's so pervasive, it worries me. So the fact that things can say more about us that we can say ourselves is just maybe worrying. Okay, so... I don't think that I can really provide a history of how we got here. I think that this is an object of really uh, interesting research. But definitely there are a couple of things that had, have contributed to us arriving here. So as you mentioned, there was the issue of security and a certain ideology that followed the attack on the Twin Towers on 9-11-2001 in the United States, which allowed the government of the United States as well as other governments to consider legitimate for the security of the state, so uh, for the security of its own citizens, for us, to collect everything that is possible about us. So they joined and cooperated with a number of uh, tech companies that were doing these, not only tech companies, but for example, commercial organizations and corporations such as banks to uh, have access to data that has been defined as private. Then another thing that I think it's very important is how tech companies and various types of business corporations um, decided to develop certain business models. Uh, so it was a commercial interest. For example, Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook, in the wake of putting Facebook on the stock exchange, decided to develop a business model for advertising. She wanted to increase, to do something to increase revenues. So she decided to join so-called data brokers to collect outside world data that is commercially interesting. So on top of the private data and all sorts of data that Facebook users were allowing the company to hold, they also linked this data with the data collected by other corporations from the outside world 
data on their consumption behavior and of all sorts of other aspects of their life. So this allowed them to link these uh, various types of data and to micro-target for advertising um, individuals and specific segments of, of the market. Okay, so I think this part here is uh, like it's the part where people could say, well, maybe I like to get better ads, so it's not a problem. Yeah, I think, people... well, well, if you think only on the commercial use, it seems like yeah, it's a good advantage that you get like personalized ads instead of, I don't know, random stuff online. And so it's kind of a bit tricky because some people agree with them and don't see the like the bigger implications of collecting such a mass amount of data. Yeah, and people are, might be like, but I have nothing to hide. I, I don't do anything illegal. Yeah. This I, heard, I hear a lot. And I think that even when you express concern about the kind of data that a certain company might store, and uh, gather about you, they are not up to the task of explaining exactly how the data is used. And I know that I have a discussion with my uh, telephony provider when I hesitated a lot to have a um, subscription. I just wanted to use a phone number that wouldn't track me. And he said, look, but nobody is interested in this kind of data and nobody is so important so that their data matter in any way. And I think that, yes, that can be an answer. But if you think to the totality of data, how this data can be indexed, how it can be related to other type of data, the kind of access that you have to where this data goes, how it is used, and um, at what point you may become an object of surveillance exactly because this data is accessible is something that it's not immediate and it's hard to understand. I think that people simply do not realize how um, much amount of data they are issuing, they, they are producing, and how much of data is stored about them and how exactly it is used. And I think that they do not understand this data necessarily as a matter of privacy, right? As you said, I have nothing to um, hide, but actually you have a lot that you want to keep to yourself or private. And I think that here comes the issue of uh, data and metadata, that it has been on a topic of discussion in the wake of the Snowden affair, um, when uh, the American government was uh, outed of collecting a huge amount of uh, private data about its citizens. And uh, there was an intervention of President Obama who said that it's not content that we access is what they called metadata. It's not the actual conversation that you had on the phone, it's but like it's the length of the, of the conversation. And who you had it with. Yeah, yeah. Space, who you, and, uh, space and time. Yes, where you were, but, yeah. when it, was it supposed started. supposed to be shooting, I oh, guess. <laughs> yes, so, so here started a long discussion of exactly what is the meaning of this metadata. And if you accumulate a huge amount of this data, actually a lot is told about you, right? If yeah, you call every day, I don't know, to a certain yeah. number and that number belongs to a company that can be easily identified and in, I don't know. Yeah, but it's it's so clear that uh, if you look at metadata, it's, it's, you don't need content because metadata already has so much content. Like if, if somebody is calls an abortion clinic, well, <laughs> I don't know, why did you call? <laughs> why did you call three times <laughs> in a week, right? Because you can call by mistake. <laughs> But then uh, I think that here is another issue and that comes and uh, complicates thing. And this has to do with uh, the legality and what juridically is considered private information and information that can be used in uh, the legal space, right? Because you cannot use information related to content in a court of law, 
right? Unless you have a certain court order or you are allowed to do this legally. But you can use metadata, right? So it's a, it's a question of how the law and the juridical terms cannot keep the pace or don't even totally understand the implications of big data here and what they say and how they can be used. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, for me, it's, re- it's pretty interesting, the topic, because you already said it, that metadata can can become content and in some time or in certain combinations. So uh, these borders, they are like uh, very fluid. What's metadata, what's data, what is content or what is knowledge? Because as I said, in certain, in certain contexts, data speaks for itself, but it's not like this all the time. Yeah, I think uh, the people call it's like the metadata thing is like uh, technical, so it's yeah. not uh, the content like you said, but the, the, the fact that we need to point out that metadata is already lots of data. It's not like, oh, it's data about data. It's still staying stuff, it's staying yeah. important stuff. Right. There is an analysis of how within the space of computer science, what is data is understood. And uh, as uh, my friend Claudia Arado pointed out, there is some sort of hierarchy, which is also a sort of ethos of using data or big data here, including both data and metadata in, in computing and in computer science. And this is the ranking between data, information and knowledge. So the idea is that you start from a huge amount of raw data, which can be both data and metadata. So what we call right data that does not hold content, respectively data that is uh, the digitalization of content and applying various sorts of algorithm and data mining and advanced visualizations, you can build information and from here you extract knowledge. So in this sense, it really doesn't matter whether you have content or what we call metadata, everything is digitalized into something that can be measured and can be processed using complex algorithms. And from here, you obtain some sort of structures that are spoken by the data. So data speaks for itself, data produces truth, and this is what they call knowledge. So for computer scientists, indeed, there is no difference between metadata and data. This is a question of the citizen and it's a matter of concern with privacy. And it's also, as I said to me, a matter of uh, legality of the juridical space. What exactly is allowed, what the state is entitled or corporations to access about ourselves, how much, where do we draw this border between private and public. But for the computer science and for the business corporations, it doesn't really make any difference in my mind. They just extract everything that this huge data seem to reveal and use it for, well, commercial purposes mainly, but also for various reasons, for raison d'etat, for example, for security, right? You use all this data to anticipate and to predict, I don't know, terrorist behavior or to select a certain segment of population that is under higher risk of producing uh, disorder. Well, yeah, I mean, theoretically, that's what it's supposed to do uh, in uh, regards to security. So I think one thing that you, that you said that was important was this part with the, the legal part. Uh, so the legal part is clearly, like you said, it needs to catch up and it's trying to catch up. Like laws are very different in the US and uh, uh, in Europe. I think in Europe, uh, people have much more, how do you call it, control over their data or at least uh, they can like ask to see if uh, certain companies have their data in a certain way, which I'm not sure they can do. Maybe now they can in the US. And of course, now there's this um, EU protection data law that it's supposed to like every Every website and everybody it's supposed to tell you look we're doing this with your data it's not like you can really opt out well yes I could go off the internet and then 
I would be fine. But uh, even with this data protection law, what, what I have to do is pretty much just click accept. And well, they told me, now I know. And uh, <laughs> the other thing is um, the security thing. So I, I think they, they, it's supposed to make us more secure, the fact that we know so much about what's going on. But from what I've read from security experts, like I've read this book about uh, written by Bruce Neyer, and I think it's uh, what they say when they look at uh, especially terrorist attacks is that the way you stop these things is through targeted surveillance. So this terrorist excuse, it's not an excuse that the government should, should use to allow corporations to collect everything. And ultimately, it's like the problem with uh, the Internet, at least, it's that the Internet is this huge global thing. Like you cannot escape the fact that the Internet goes through cables, that there's IPs, that everything is pretty much connected. So if you do something on one website, it might, I think, technically, I'm not really sure, but I think it might like travel through different cables that are probably in the US. So even if you're in Romania, in the European Union, you're still not escaping this. I think that there's a lot that the citizens do not know about how the infrastructure works. I think that there's a lot of data of which we don't even think about. I think there's also a lot of data that cannot be captured by all these uh, regulations that, at least in the European Union, now you have. And one example of which I read recently and which is a real matter of concern is, for example, fingerprinting of one's computer, which means that you can uniquely identify with the chance of missing of 5% someone's computer on the Internet by the kind of data that the computer emits For example, the size of the screen, the kind of fonts that the user uses. So there are all sorts of uh, little so-called mimes that are involved and and crawlers. And it has been um, revealed that there are quite a few corporations that collect this kind of data. And this is something, and also um, there is a technology that some of them use that identify your computer, so it fingerprints it, but then the devices by which it is fingerprinted are um, deleted in a matter of you uploading the specific web, web page that you access and which helps fingerprinting your computer. So this is a kind of uh, metadata that I think that uh, goes beyond the kind of big data that we are talking when we talk about social networks and the kind of uh, data collected by data brokers with, with which they associate and which also is extremely powerful. It can be used uh, not by the state. It can be used for whatever purpose that can, in my opinion, explode the kind of um, measures that states take with respect to security. So what were you telling? It's um, kind of interesting because I saw this do- documentary and uh, there was some uh, intervention from uh, one of the data analysts, I guess. Uh, and he was telling, yeah, in a way, we don't know you, or at least we say we don't know you. But in the end, we Uh, as you said, we know what font do you use, you know what uh, websites you access, so we kind of know everything about you. Even though the, like the, in the common discourse uh, about metadata is that uh, we, can, we, we are not interested in the content, but uh, it's kind of a big security problem here because they can uh, trace every um, aspect that you leave on the internet and every, every trace. They can find every trace that you leave on the internet. Yeah, it's funny because uh, from time to time there's one of these big scary articles coming along like Facebook knows more about you than your partner does. 
and uh, there was this uh, this article do, do you know it i know that facebook knows so much more than i do about myself <laughs> it, it has this um, i forgot what i've done five years ago but facebook knows and it reminds you <laughs> that there were people i think they did something like people were asking questions about uh, they, they were being asked questions about their friends and then maybe their friends knew some things that facebook knew but like facebook knew more than than their partner or something like that. And anyway, it knows you, it, it it can I kind of like identify your political spectrum from the music I think you listen to or something like from your c- cultural consumption, I mean. I found that uh, it kind of make uh, some sort of a portrait about you by your tastes in which they try to like analyze in what age do are you uh what are your tastes um how maybe you do act, how do you act? in the world and uh, it's kind of scary that they can like do so many things just by looking at the uh, at what will, are you listening or that what do you search or what do you play online yeah yeah i think this is like where sociologists should come in because this is like um, Pierre Bourdieu and he would be here he would be he would be like wow we have so much data on so many uh, everybody's cultural taste we can tell so much about their cultural capital because uh, he he when i when i say his name i always see this uh, graphic with cultural yeah. capital and economic capital and how he wrote about the french uh, society and how he placed peop- how he saw that people in cert- that had a certain um, amount of money consumed certain things and and had a certain amount of um, knowledge they read something else so everybody was it was really easy to tell and then facebook does this now <laughs> whole internet does this right now so indeed um, the people associated with cambridge analytica had a, a number of researchers and for example in tw- t- uh, 2012 kosinski showed that based on 68 likes on facebook of a user you can predict the color of the skin with an accuracy of 90% you can predict affiliation to the democratic party or the republican party you can predict the level of intelligence the religious denomination alcohol consumption i don't know including <laughs> whether the parents are or are not divorced oh and my I, god <laughs> okay yes well so if you spent like two months on facebook and you sort of did these clicks then facebook can predict this about you and i think that um this is uh, computationally uh, important to stress that everything that follows certain patterns in the social life is very well identifiable through algorithms and using big data the problem is that rare events <laughs> cannot be predicted by this kind of data but now the um, association with uh, pierre bourdieu i think that he would have been really impressed by this kind of, kind of data and also uh, there would have been several hypotheses that he could have tested with this of course his main hypothesis was that taste is a good marker of class of social class and i think that all this data just supports his theory but i think that the difference between the kind of research that Bourdieu did and the kind of well say knowledge that uh, these kind of studies show is that Bourdieu had a hypothesis in this kind of uh, epistemology big data just shows the truth the truth comes out of the data and there's really no need to have a theory behind it the death of theory is proclaimed by this kind of studies and moreover anyone can read these results you don't really need to have someone from the profession to find meaning in these results and i think that this is a huge difference um between the kind of science that bourdieu was producing which was based n- no on a model of how society works of what are the values within that society how they are reproduced uh, what are the institutions that help reproduce this structure of society whereas here you just have a way of showing patterns and of making good business use out of them 
I think it's definitely where sociology would be of help, not just and it's it's just there's so much that needs to be understand how this data is produced what does it mean what does it say about society what what does it mean that you can tell so much about somebody from what he likes so this is a, a big question you shouldn't like take it for granted yeah it's it's and we should ask also well, what do they see or what do they look at when they examine the big data because as you said it it kind of speaks for itself but it's not like that because these people still look at something they don't just look at data and say yeah they extrapolate and say yeah that this is that and uh, but they have something in mind when they look at the data well of course they try to predict behaviors and uh, when you want to sell things then you want you want to know what people would buy so you want to target advertisements f- for selling various products to someone who would really be interested. You want to make most efficient your investment in advertising. And we all know that we spend more on advertising than we spend of producing a certain product. And uh, I think that the difference is uh, in the following way that you spend about 30 cents to producing a, a, an object and then you spend about $50 to advertise it. So if you want to be efficient here you would really want to know what exactly a person would buy so this is what you're looking for you're looking for the type of characteristics of a person who would buy a certain product so you're looking at associations of characteristics in individuals and you try to find segments of the population for which a certain product product um, is interesting and then you address certain ads directly to that segment of the population. And this is on one hand. And on the other hand, you also want to use this kind of data to influence behavior. And I think that this is uh, interesting how the kind of ethos and the kind of data that Facebook collects and does is related to commercial data brokers. For example, you hear again and again Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of Facebook, saying that what Facebook does is connect people and what he wants is engagement. So you want people to get engaged, right? To get engaged, that means that they are very active on the network, socially. You want to have a big planet, planetary conversation. So this is the ethos. But then how this happens is mixing with a certain business model. And the business model is that you want to engage people. You want to have as many clicks as possible, both for collecting data, more data, because this increases granularity, granularity, this increases the um, accuracy of prediction. But also you want people to engage because you want to be paid more for advertisement on certain segments of the users of Facebook. And the business model here is mixed with the theories that come from social psychology, which show that most engagement comes from contradictory issues, from charged issues, from tribalism. So basically what Facebook does, and this is how their algorithms work, is that they tend to emphasize and to structure the communication on Facebook in a way that increases engagement. And because this engagement happens around controversial issues on tensions and on, uh, as I said, tribal issues that means that there's a tendency not to have uh, the rational discussion that you have in the ideal type of public sphere that Jürgen Habermas, for example, was theorizing. What you have are certain groups, certain chambers where people really cut at each other's throat because this brings engagement, this brings advertising and this brings money. So it's a mixture that I think that Facebook people do not really seem to be able to disentangle where the business model is 
a mix or is um, phrased in terms of um, social representation of what it intends to do and on how they seem to reimagine society within the boundaries of Facebook. And as they do not seem to distinguish between these two, they do not seem to understand the consequences of such a business slash social model. And they also do not seem to understand the, the responsibility that they should assume when they have such an access on the private life of individuals and also such an influence on the private and social events where all these individuals are involved. So it's no surprise that um, we talk so much about Facebook. Well, the internet is so much more than Facebook, but it's Facebook that shapes so much of the use right now. So I think I've read about these uh, rural places in, that didn't have access to internet and Facebook was um, giving out some kind of access to internet, but uh, it would give out access only to Facebook, I think, or um, only to particular parts of the, the internet, right? Um, it was a business solution that uh, Facebook was offering in a number of countries in Africa. Uh, so they were offering a certain infrastructure, but they were offering just a very specific horizon of uh, internet. For example, it was all just in English, whereas many people who were using, uh, would have used the internet, could not speak English. So it was dubbed as some sort of uh, new digital colonialism, and it was banned in, the, in certain of these places. I think it's, but on the other part, it's like weird because Facebook does so much weird stuff, but it's kind of not a big scandal anymore. Oh, we all know Facebook is bad. We're still kind of using it. And that's just it. Like I, I read uh, this news a few days ago that uh, Facebook actually put out a virtual private network, their own VPN. The VPN is supposed to protect you. It's supposed to be like the private thing that you should do on the internet to protect your IP address, to protect where your data goes. So that's the thing that's supposed to be like the premium the version of Facebook or what? It's like the premium version of Facebook. No, you, can, you don't have to pay for it or no, no, no. It's uh, the, the virtual private network is supposed to be like your safety net. It's kind mm -hmm. of like you're blinded. Nobody knows what you're doing because you, they cannot follow your IP. But the thing is that apparently the, this Facebook VPN that they, they put out, it was pulled from the Android store because guess what? They were actually collecting this data and It's like, I think if you don't pay attention, this doesn't even, it doesn't pop out on your maybe Facebook wall, obviously. <laughs> and if you're, if you're there all the time getting your news from there, then, which I think people actually do. I mean, I think some of the news that I get is from my Facebook wall. Well, usually. <laughs> well, I think that uh, this is one of the issues um, that I take with Facebook at all times. And one is, uh, so the fact that Facebook is much more than a tech company. When you have, I don't know, 40% of the population which is on Facebook, getting their news from Facebook, it's obviously much more than a social network. It functions also as a media company. It also functions as somebody who broadcasts, no, think that Facebook broadcasts much more than any television and the kind of stories that they share and they circulate have an audience that is so much bigger than those of New York Times, for example, or regular information and media outlets. And the thing is that Whereas I think that many people recognize that this company functions like this, it is not regulated as such. So the big problem with Facebook is that no government, not the government of the United States, not the government of any country in the European Union or the European Commission has actually attempted to regulate Facebook in this way. And um, there's a 
larger problem that has to do with companies that use this kind of big data and that have a business model of this sort where you actually pretend to be something else than what you are doing. And here I take issue with Uber, which is considered an app, not a transportation business. So they try to avoid regulation that applies to consumer transportation companies. Of course, recently they have been challenged in various countries, but there's a very long way to go to understand exactly <laughs> what these companies are doing, how they affect various domains of social life and of uh, economic and all other types of activities uh, which go unregulated because they misrepresent themselves for something else. Okay, so changing the topic a bit, uh, I'm pretty curious about the knowledge problem and uh, more specifically the interaction between human and computers in uh, analyzing the big data because I, I read that it, it's, it's pretty common to say that yeah, these data are stored in computers and hardly everyone ever looks at them and in the end it's not that we know something about you because they just sit there in computers and no one is like really interested in them. I think that there are um, many dimensions here. First of all is where exactly the human interacts with technology to produce things. For example, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? How intelligent can be machines without the input and the constant supervision of humans? And I think that if we look attentively at what happens, you can see that there's always some sort of monitoring and intervention that uh, humans do at various points in the functioning of algorithms and of complex systems where they intervene. So the idea that the machine is producing the truth and the knowledge is a bit of an exaggeration. But then another thing is that the kind of data that the apps use actually affect directly the lives of people. And I'm coming here to all these uh, new apps that are structuring what we call the gig economy. Uber is just one company among those, but you can find them anywhere. For example, it's very common now in the United States to use an app to find someone to care for your children. And it functions according to the app based on a system of measurement where each individual is uh, scored by various uh, users so by employers who have used their services and then you mix all sorts of scoring systems with criteria that the employer want to select a person so in the end the person who offers these services is at the end as i said at the beginning an appendix at this huge app that works according to algorithms based on metrics and measurement, where they are ranked and they are penalized. There's a system of re rewards that is uh, ingrained within the system. And I think that here is also important to see how these apps produce and magnify inequality in the people. For example, you really need to be connected to a very good internet connection in order to have first access to gigs that are offered by the app. Otherwise, you never get to get in time to express your interest for a certain job if you don't have a, a good connection or even worse, if you do not have very good skills using these digital devices. And you can see this everywhere. There are various ways in which this connection between an app, between technology and data and the humans at some ends of the whole system creates inequality and uh, creates more advantage for, for people who already have uh, an advantage. And, and here I can give uh, some more very striking examples 
of how, for example, stock exchanges work, where you have automatic operations that are done by machines on the stock exchange, buying and selling, where the advantage comes from a very fast internet connection and some um, power cords that are sold directly by the stock exchange. And uh, this is a really fascinating issue. So I've been researching this topic of big data before. I, w I researched it for another project I work on, on which we make animated videos, just wondering. And uh, we have this video upcoming uh, about cyber surveillance. And the way we looked at, the way I, I kind of chose to or saw big data back then, it was this huge technological thing that maybe we could wield to do good things with it, like science research or sometimes bad things with it, like normalize how the population should look or how people should do. But now I, I'm more I'm more interested in what does it mean, just the fact that this data exists, how it's produced, the knowledge side of it. To me, it's obvious that this amount of data for certain positivist models works very well. And indeed, in hard sciences, they can show you a lot of patterns, a lot of connections that previously you could, you were not able to see. And I think that the metaphor of the microscope that it used, it is used in relation to big data is a very good one to express how much more detail, how many more connections you are now able to master that you weren't before. And it's usually the comparison with the telescope, which allowed better observation, astronomical observation, which changed the way that we understood the whole universe. So the telescope gathered that kind of information and enlarged our horizon of data, which changed the knowledge that we have. And it's the same with the microscope, right? We had the microscope and then we could see things that we couldn't see before. The difference is that previously you could anticipate and you had a model of what you were supposed to see. So people usually find found out looking into a microscope things that they have envisioned before. So it's a dialectical process in which you build theory based on empirical data and then you are able to produce and process empirical data which will support or which will help you re design the theoretical understanding of the object you're looking at. What big data does indeed is that functions as a, an enormous microscope. It gives you such a huge, such a detailed, such a large amount of detail. The problem is that if you do not have also a theoretical model behind it, you do not understand the meaning of the things that this microscope shows you. Okay, that's not necessarily the case when you already have a theory. And it's this idea that instead of having a static, one-time collection of data on which you build your models, now you have continuously moving in-time feeding systems of data gathering that show you phenomena in a much detailed way, in a much powerful way than before. And in the hard sciences, this works very well. You can predict, for example, tectonic movements based on all sorts of um, information that is gathered by sensors. You can predict in advance a lot of phenomena that would otherwise be much more difficult um, to know. But I think that this also has downside. And uh, there is this very well-known example of how by linking a newborn baby to a lot of instruments that continuously collect data on how their organs work and what the vital signs are, 
you can predict in advance when the child gets an infection. And uh, this is a very powerful way to prevent a necessary disease in a child. But the fact is <laughs> that it was shown that the kind of infection that these kind of data have been able to predict was infections that were due to the presence of the instruments gathering the information themselves. Okay. So really? this is yes. So <laughs> this is really funny in a way because exactly the presence increase the presence of these foreign yes, bodies yes, yeah. in a space of a newborn child that is premature and is under higher risk of infection. So the kind of bacteria that they found um, was associated with the presence of the instruments. And if you take, I don't know, a nurse who has been working for 30 years with newborns, she would be able almost <laughs> with the same accuracy to discover the same a, th yes to Th see this is incredibly to ironic. see the signs in a, yes and also they would say something like washing your hands very well is a very good thing in a neonatal <laughs> ward right yeah this is so, it says so much about uh, it's like so much about science and how science works and I'm the, I was just thinking while we were talking I'm amazed I never thought about this what would Bruno Latour said says say if he said anything about big data like how would well, how would he look at it I don't know if he did because if this big data is like a science and it is produced then we can maybe look at how this happens I'm not sure if uh, Bruno Latour said something about it, but he might have. But of course that he was preaching this um, view on uh, social reality, which takes object or inanimate things on an ontological position similar to humans. So we have to, it was one step into post-humanist theories that try to integrate non-humans into our understanding of what's going on in social life and the way that we react and here it's not only objects like the internet of things but it's also animals or <laughs> any other kind of uh, feeling bodies and objects there that are around us and um, to me what is important here is how we view these things Another person who was theorizing about integrating technology into the space of uh, human life was Donna Haraway. And, but the kind of metaphors that various social scientists use was very different. And that means that they were giving different understandings to the relationship with these objects, to their impact, to the behaviors and the meanings that we give to behaviors and so on and so forth. And coming back to big data, what is striking here is this metaphor of a planetary brain that is wired by all the inputs that we do all the time. It's like the electric inputs in a brain are all these traces that we leave continuously in the way that we engage and interact with the objects. So the metaphor transmits the idea that we are no longer autonomous individuals who have clear boundaries, but we are some, I don't know, little cells or, you know, click emitters or uh, emitters of some sort of signals that are then wired by this huge network to contribute to a human brain, which is, I don't know, the internet. And this is the one who thinks us. We do not think it, it thinks us. And I think that this is a vision that uh, you can find very often in the field of computer science, in the field of uh, various um, professions that help develop the technology. And it's associated with a kind of optimism that loses sight of what human beings actually are. The fact that they have sentiments, the fact that they might 
choose not rationally who their friends are, the fact that they might learn something from a failure and so on and so forth. So I think it's a very, um, it's a metaphor that we should think about in terms of uh, the consequences that it generates and the way that it structures the whole approach to science, the approach of human behavior, of the way the societies are uh, regulated and in including the way that the advances of technology are presented to us. And there was this, this other example that I found very striking and I didn't really know what to do with in which it said, and it has to do with this new tendency of self-surveillance, of self-tracking. People are now wired uh, to all sorts of devices which tracks everything. That they do, right? Yes, yeah, that the, the, the Fitbits, the, yeah, you know, the heart rate, the level of sugar in the blood, the... I don't know, moment of the month in the ovulation of women, all these sorts of things, uh, how many, I don't know, steps you've done, how many calories you used. It's a lot of information that aggregated gives score for yeah. your physical state. But it's not just and this, it can be anything, your, your dreams, apps for anything that you do, what you eat. Yeah, I think it's pretty good to analyze this situation and see the both implications because when we look, I don't know, on the internet, it's just this technical part that yeah, it improves our lives, our the quality of our lives, I don't know, the length of our lives, and uh, we should use them because they are something good. But uh, we don't like analyze in uh, on the long term the implication of these new methods. I don't know. We can say that it's some sort of extension of the self because yeah. even just what it says about ourselves. I mean, I don't know if you people use tracking apps. I use. I use, I, I I'm a bit of a like I track myself sometimes uh, I have this app that's uh, that tracks everything I do on the computer and then at the end of the week it tells me how much time I spend playing games or doing research <laughs> so uh, it's it, it has like a different outlook of my week because sometimes maybe I have the impression that I do something but like at the end of the week I find out I have been doing something else I think there are those really popular with uh, you know that uh, follow your you uh, are uh, the, the places where you go and how much uh, steps you take And this like a recommended, I don't know, number, I don't know, 10,000 steps per day, or I'm not sure. And like everybody use them. I mean, all of my friends, I think even my family have this application which uh, tracks how many steps they are doing per day. Steps, the new uh, step towards health, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> It's all related to this uh, management of the self. Yeah. It's a way of using technology to do it in a very accurate, very professional way, continuously capturing information about individuals, of course, that serve a business interest. For example, you can track continuously the behavior of cashers and uh, poke them when they do not smile enough. So there's a continuous feedback which is based on continuous surveillance. And in this uh, is uh, very much in the line of the surveillance in the view of Foucault and of the panopticon where you start to regulate uh, uh, yourself. But the thing is that with Fitbits, and the kind of self-tracking that we do, there isn't necessarily someone who you expect to surveil you and then you bring the surveillance within yourself. Or maybe we can consider that there is this vague notion of society who surveils you. This is on one hand and then you use all these Fitbits to make the best version of yourself. And this is a thing that I very often hear that people just want to be the best versions of themselves. And this is how they um, justify all sorts of uh, tracking and regulating <laughs> devices that they use. But on the other hand, I think that there's another thing on which this technology of collating data is based and of um, prompting certain kind of behaviors that serve the uh, commercial business model. And this is the addictive features 
of some of the technologies. I think that it is addictive to check your signs, your activity every day or every moment or at the end of the week. It's a sort of fascination with yourself that you get that feeds into this kind of of behavior. And of course, you do not think that this data is collected about you by someone else who then, you know, feeds it into uh, technology and to a whole system that, <laughs> that makes you do it more and more and more. Is the way that algorithms on YouTube works, for example, to make you see more and more and more videos by that automatic uh, list of videos following and which suggests that you watch some videos based on your previous things that you have watched and based on certain characteristics that you have. And it's the same on Facebook, um, the way that the whole wall is organized, the, the way that you engage the platform feeds into this addictive um, behavior. And it, it seems to me then the Fitbits and, and all these means of self-surveillance also feed into some sort of uh, addictive behavior that transform you into an object, an interest, and makes your world very you know, commensurate with your own person. And um, the other metaphor where you are just uh, an element in a click farm for a whole business that lives on clicks and that make predictions and uh, ways of economically and financially acting on the aggregate of clicks that you do. But it's also associated with a vision in which the borders of your world become yourself and the image and representation that you produce of yourself via um, these uh, technological elements that measure your activity all the time and via the way that you can represent yourself in a social media without actually being there. So if you look at this, uh, this, this the way that we track ourselves and uh, it's amazing just how private these things can get it's like our health and then of course there are these menstruation apps that are really useful i mean it's good to know when the period comes but if you put it all together then there are apps that know when you where you sleep and if you put this together with connection to the internet then there's this if you connect all this database there will be whole sets of data about what you do at night and who whom with because the the person is going to have a phone that's going to be working right next to your phone so that's very interesting because there is often this um, play of words uh, that associate big brother with big data and uh, i think that it's important to see how the kind of surveillance that is associated <laughs> with the you know George Orwell's um, dystopia of 1984, where you have this big brother following you everywhere, has now metamorphosized into something else, <laughs> which is a even bigger big brother. It's big data, and it is something that you inflict on yourself. So you do not have these agents that follow you everywhere. Like, you know, Verdi was followed, Catherine Verdi was followed by Securitate guys who are taking pictures and filming and interviewing people with whom he, she talked. No, now you are volunteering all this and to such amount that is <laughs> unbelievable. You basically turn yourself out with everything that you do, with your heartbeats, with your level of sugar, with uh, the interactions that you have, the phone, everything. So I think it's important to see how the paradigm has changed for that kind of authoritarian, brutal, violent yes, surveillance into this kind of benevolent... Internalized. <laughs> yeah, and and, I, and I externalized. Say. It's just something that you volunteer to do. There's nobody... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know we do volunteer it, but at the same time, I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't stress it's so, a choice so much because at the end of the day, we want to be connected. We want to be good people. And the, if this is how it looks to be connected and to be good people, then it's really hard to stay away from all of this. Now, that's true that the only way that you can stay outside of the technology is to stay outside of the society, which this technology structured. And the, the, I think 
you are totally right. You can't disconnect from these. You can be aware of what you do. And this is actually another thing that people that were concerned with the revelations of uh, the activity of NSA uh, in the wake of Edward Snowden scandal showed was the way that people changed their behavior online when they realized how much they are surveilled. So actually, it's very important to see how much of our behavior is affected by knowledge of this kind of surveillance and how much we actually repress and suppress things that we do because we know that we are tracked, we know that we cannot get out of it, and then the way that you control it is just to um, repress or to constrain the things that you do and that can be tracked. Uh, so as a sort of wrap-up, uh, thank you, Irina, for being here and introducing, even just even if it's just a small part, into the this world of big data and how does it work and how does it operate and also on the history of it. Maria and Vlad, I was very happy to be here. I tried to structure some of these ideas, but as you have seen, there's a huge field of problems that this technology both allows and raises. Um, there's a huge advancement in the the data that we can use to improve our lives, but there's also a lot of uh, concern to which we have to be uh, alert uh, with respect to how these methods of data collection and surveillance affect our lives. And I think that it is very important to understand exactly the kind of trade-off that is going on with respect to Uh, assurances uh, that everything is done in the name of our security and protection and how much this infringes on the liberties that we are entitled as citizens and that we um, used to take for granted. And uh, I think that beyond the issues that are very substantial that have to do with the new understanding of the knowledge that big data produces of the new paradigms of uh, understanding and representing the words that big data produce and allows, we should also try to understand what are the social effects that um, the technology, the infrastructure and the agents upon which this uh, technology is uh, interlinked, produces on our lives, on our behaviors, and on the way that we understand ourselves and um, the way that um, we live our lives and the experiences that we have. Thank you, Thank you Irina. Irina. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Contrasense. Today's guest was Irina Kulik. This week's episode was produced by Maria and Vlad, soundtrack by Kind Studios, and it was recorded at Radio EBS. This podcast is partially supported by the Faculty of Sociology and Social Work from the University of Babes Boja in Cluj-Napoca. If you like the episode, you can support us by donating to our Patreon. You'll find the link below. More about us on our Facebook page. Ha <laughs> ha. And you can listen to us on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes and Spotify. We're looking forward to your feedback and questions at contrasense@protonmail.com.